So I used to not push myself to the point where I could fail. I would get myself so far and then bail out and say, that didn't work. When right. really, if I just pushed myself a little bit further, I might have succeeded and I might have failed. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to understand about the idea of failure now and what I coach people on and talk to people about is that failure is merely a data point in life. It's a sort of a like a, an information point that says, okay, so that might not have worked out how I thought it was going to work out. Right. But this is what I learned about that particular experience. And sometimes there's like weird hidden, um, you know, silver linings or whatever you want to call it, where sure. unexpected things happen out of failure that you could never have anticipated. Mm -hmm. And that is my friend, Sarah Hepburn, and I'm excited to have her on this episode of the Being School podcast. In this episode, we discuss her new book, Walking Forward, that was released just a few months ago. And that book is about using the power of habit, both consciously and unconsciously, to navigate the chaos and uncertain times as you move towards the world you want to be in. Besides the book, we talk about journaling, competitive synchronized swimming, writing groups, the self-publishing process, success and failure, and fear, and so much more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Sarah Hepburn. Yeah, got I got it now. I got it. We're going to do this. Okay. So awesome. Thank you so much for taking some time to be here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm super excited. Good. Good. Well, I'll tell you where I kind of wanted to start with things is to just talk a little bit about your background in terms of kind of where you grew up and your family and wherever you want to go with that in terms of kind of the zero to college background, let's say, and then kind of go from there. For sure. Yeah. So I grew up um, pretty much, I grew up in the Toronto area. So in, in Canada, in Southern, Southern Ontario, I guess is probably the best mm -hmm. way to put it. But mostly in the Toronto area, so pretty uh, urban city kid growing up. Huh. And, uh, you know, it's um, interesting because I live nowhere near, I mean, more suburbia now where I live. And so I grew up things like taking the subway to school. And um, that was kind of my frame of reference. You kind of walked everywhere and rode the subway and cars were, you know, it was nice to be able to drive, but it wasn't like was more of a pain in the butt than anything um, right so I um, my parents still live in the house where I spent the majority of my childhood in Toronto and I have two younger sisters and okay. I was a competitive synchronized swimmer for most of my teenage teenage years I stopped when I was 18 so that occupied a lot of my time in in uh, certainly in high school and I guess middle school as well mm -hmm. so by the end of high school i was you know training you know anywhere from six to eight times a week depending on what the week looked like yeah that's a big commitment especially at that age commitment. yeah it was a huge commitment and i loved it because like my friends were my my teammates and mm -hmm. that was my you know my big social life and um you know i really thrived in the the structured environment of of the pool and you know the mix of early mornings some evening sessions mm -hmm. um, it uh i had the opportunity to travel i know a lot of different pools across canada which is kind of an amusing a little side amusing that. side note i can of... i can picture what the swimming pool looks like in i don't know calgary or vancouver and even in a lot of smaller communities in ontario as well so there's i know which ones have like you know, they're deep the whole way through and which ones we had to modify some of our routines because the pool was shallower in sections. Um, bizarre facts that periodically come back to me even now, which is kind of amusing. Well, and that's not something that is like a childhood sport. I mean, you don't hear a lot of uh, synchronized swimmers. No. I, yeah. That's, that's, I, how, did you, I got, how did you get interested in that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a good question. So I... Um, was always, well, I guess one of the reasons was I was an asthmatic growing up and my mom discovered that swimming was really good for me. Um, hmm. The idea of the breath control that comes with learning your swimming strokes and 
diving in and out of the water and I loved it. So she would just keep putting me in swimming lesson after swimming lesson after swimming lesson. Right. Um, and as a result, I blasted through all my, all my levels really uh, quickly. Okay. And I had gotten to the point where I was too young to do any of the lifeguarding qualifications mm -hmm. for swimming. So she put me in a learn uh, as a beginner synchronized swimming program. Okay. And it just kind of went from there. That more from there. So then where did your, now we kind of met through uh, nature and being outdoors in a sense. So I've always seen like the love of nature side of you where, mm -hmm. and you talk about that in your writing and in your book, Walking Forward, um, which we'll obviously get to, but where do you, where does your love of nature come from then as if you grew up as a city kid? Yeah, so I grew up as a city kid, but I also grew up going to summer cottages, mm -hmm. um, which is like, I guess, growing up in the Toronto area, they were always called cottages in, you know, different parts of Canada. And, and I suppose in the U.S. as well, some like, people call them cabins or camps or country homes or okay. whatever. Um, but very much where I grew up, summers are short because of the four seasons. Uh -huh. And everyone kind of tries to spend as much time by the lakes and by the water as possible. So until I was probably 16, we used to spend a ton of time at my aunt's cottage. And okay. uh, I had cousins similar in age. And so we would go up there for longer stretches of the time. And my mom often had my sisters and I and my cousins and then whoever was working would appear on weekends of the other adults. And so we had a grand old time, you know, and especially on hot days, there's nothing better. There's no better place to be than by the water and jumping in and out of a lake and right. And exactly. all that. So I didn't really appreciate it until later in life, just how much I loved spending that time outdoors um, and going to things like sleepover summer camp, mm -hmm. um, and learning how to paddle a canoe and sail a boat and do all those things. Um, right. but that, I would say that was probably like those formative cottage years, um, really kind of set the ground, the ground for it. Okay. And, yeah. and then, and then in terms of obviously you have a passion for and a love of writing where, when in your kind of progression when did that really start for you so I've always written um, I can remember actually I think my first officially published thing uh, piece was a poem called acorns <laughs> um, and I might have been I think I was probably eight or nine when that was published I still have the, the book it was just a, like a school publication but I was right. so I was so proud that my poem that I'd written for whatever class had made it in um, but I've always been like a keeper of, of notes and writing letters to people and um, journals and uh -huh. all those things all my life. Um, they used to be, <laughs> I can remember they used to be those like journals that had, you know, the lock on it um, mm -hmm. where it would exactly. be like you'd lock everything in. Um, at times I had like the fluffy pencils to write on. Um, my journal style has certainly changed over the years, but that's really, so it's always been something that I've always done is I've always written because it's always been a way for me to help think and right. process, process my thoughts. So you don't still use the lock and the fluffy pencils, the, no. it's not still your writing style? Not still my writing style. It's more of a mechanical pencil in a sketchbook type style currently. Although I've used various like moleskin notebooks over the years too. So it's, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. so this, and this gets a little bit into the weeds, but I'm always curious, especially with writers. So are you a lined and or unlined kind of paper journaling person? And um, where do you think that originates or what's kind of your thought process behind which one you use? I use blank pages. Okay. Um, and there's, t if I flip back through all like various ones and even I'm like even talking as recently as like last month, for example, Sometimes I do write, you know, in like with the book in a portrait layout and I'll write line by line. Okay. Other times I'll flip it and I'll write landscape. Sometimes I'll create columns and I'll flip through writing columns. There's been times when I write just on an angle in the uh -huh. book or I sketch or doodle. I'm, I'm not a particularly talented like artist in terms of like sketching. 
Um, right. But I'll noodle around notes and play with letters and do stuff like that as a way to um, occupy things. So it's really, it, I like the blank pages because it affords me the freedom not to be constrained by how the book wants me to write. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's super, that's actually really fascinating. Do, so, kind of delving into that just a little bit more. So, do you do you just find the blank page kind of frees you up more in yep. terms of your creativity and your thought process and so it, it definitely does. And then how much do you switch between, let's say, you know, sketching or doodling and, and writing on a daily Yeah, basis? I would say like probably 90% of it is writing. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting to me though is I have, if I look back, so for example, I actually just went back to one of my journals um, from 1998 and I can't, I was surprised I still had it lying around. Um, but it was, I was trying to find, um, one of my sons is doing this trip right now. And so I was trying to go back to when I had been there, he's in Australia and I was trying to go back to a few of the places uh -huh. because I realized that one of the hostels he stayed at is where I was in 1998 or 1997, I guess. That's crazy. Um, it was, was so that, crazy. Was it planned or is it like totally random that this happened? Totally random. It just happened to be the one that he booked himself into. And then... He, uh, I said, well, where are you staying now? And he's like, oh, it's there. I was like, what? And so I immediately texted my sister, who I'd been on the trip with, and she's like, oh, yeah, that's where we stayed. And I, so anyway, at that point, I found my journal, and it has, like, I had taken such detailed trip notes right down to how much bus fare was, um, what I ate for dinner. My, I mean, my Lord, like, I don't even know what I was thinking. It was so fascinating to see what was how my brain worked mm -hmm. um, at that point. But what was so interesting is even throughout the course of the pages, my handwriting is very different. And the same is true now. And it's almost, I don't know if it's like how I'm feeling, if I'm, I haven't quite done like a, a deep dive into why my handwriting looks so different at different, at different points. Um, mm. But even like the current, notebook I'm working with now I think is from about the last week in April is when I started it okay and it's it changes like almost every time I was going back through some notes this morning and I was like hmm. yeah I that's like, interesting how did I, I do in that day when I wrote that <laughs> I, I find sometimes I'll switch between you know cursive and printing you know I'll go back and forth in that sense and that, yes yeah, it's, it's not something I've thought about but now that you mentioned it, I think I think writing Right, especially if you're a handwriter, and I think that's one mm -hmm. of the beauties of handwriting versus you know typing into a computer is that yeah I don't know there's there's a richness there that you would never capture um, just by looking at you know keystrokes or or the the words on a digital screen versus what you've done in your journal. Yeah, like it's really I find my handwriting is almost like a picture to me. It tells it somehow tells a story. Right. Beyond right. the words written on the page. Right. Well, I do want to. I do want to jump into your book a bit, but so so we left off. Com you were a competitive swimmer in high school, and then yeah. I think what was fascinating to me after after reading your book was understanding a little bit about kind of the switch that happened. I think for you in college between let's say your first year ish, or I I can't remember the exact time frame of when you actually met the man that turned out to be your husband, but kind of before meeting him and his group of friends and and after so i'd love to dig into that a little bit if you're up for yeah, it. yeah for sure so i stopped swimming um just as i was about to start um university and um when i got there i lived in residence and it was like this wide open world to me that i felt like i'd never experienced before there was no right. Um, there weren't any expectations as far as coaches or teachers or parents. Um, I didn't have teammates to be accountable to. Right. Uh, my roommate was never there, so she really didn't care if I was around. So it was great. Like, I mean, at first I was like, this is great. I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I'm just going to stay out as late as I want, eat whatever I want, maybe go to class sometimes. Um, and it was a pretty rude awakening of that you know you can do that for a short period of time um, but it's certainly not sustainable and it's certainly not going to contribute to you performing particularly well right. academically exactly either. yes <laughs> um, yeah, yeah yeah i think we've all been there 
for sure. Yeah, and it was like it was a giant kind of a giant wake up call of like, you know, what are you like what are you doing type idea, and the pattern really continued until I started to, um, I mean, until I actually ended up started dating who's now my husband. Um, and he was really serious about school and he was a good student and he worked really hard. Um, and he had a group around him that they would study and work together. And I started hanging out with them a little bit more instead Mm -hmm. of either spinning my, spinning my wheels in my own place or going to the library and doing nothing but, I don't know, socializing or like reading whatever particularly interested me at that moment, which I was really good at finding anything but what I was supposed to be doing. Right. (laughs) Um, And then I started studying with them a little bit. And, you know, we were in this environment that was, that's all anybody else was doing. So it was kind of a little bit a matter of either you study or you don't, or get out. Type right, environment, right? And so, really, just being around people that were doing what I wanted to be doing, but didn't quite know how to get myself there, um, really made it, made all the difference. And I didn't mm-hmm. fully appreciate it till I started thinking about how, when you're around people, that combination of that accountability, but there's almost like this like pull that you can get towards achieving what you want to achieve right. along the way. Yeah. Well, and that that's interesting, which it really does lead me into thinking about it, kind of the process you went through in writing your book. Um, mm-hmm. So you worked, and, and we can delve into this, but you worked with a, a group, right? You were part mm-hmm. of a, a writing group process. So I'd love to hear a bit about kind of that and how that went for you and, and what you thought um, of that experience. But then also just as a background question, had you tried or worked on the book before starting that process and what kind of what did that look like yeah so it kind of all started um it was the like december ish of 2019 Mm -hmm. and i as i do every year i was you know looking back on the year past and um thinking about you know what worked and what i wanted to do in the year to come And I was really thinking about writing and writing was a funny one where I'd always thought about myself as a writer. But then as I started to kind of think about it a little bit more, it was like, if I'm not, if I'm not actually writing, does that make me a writer? Um, And so it really started where I said the first six weeks of 2020, I'm going to sit down every day and write 500 words a day. So that was my my initial goal and I made it just a really quiet, very personal objective. Uh And, um, it was kind of a bit of a rocky start in that I sat down thinking I would just have this like wave of inspiration and it was kind of a bust the first few mornings. Um, but once I got going, it really, it was almost like addictive to Mm -hmm. getting, to sitting down every day and writing. And I realized it really reminded me of how much, I loved it and how much I loved writing and just how little of it I'd been doing in the few years preceding that. Um, So then I started sharing what I called essays on my personal blog. Um, And then fast forward to about the summer of 2021 and I joined this writing accountability group and I thought I still don't totally know what my book is going to be about. Kind of, I'm, it's, I'm starting to have an idea. Like the original idea of the book was meant to be habits at home, which was building off my experience in the interior design field. And so I started with this writing accountability group, which I had been someone I knew she had gone through th- with this group. And you know, she'd said to me, she said, "Sarah, you know." I know you're wanting to do this. I've read your essay. She said, why don't you start by this? And so it's, we would get together uh, every other week for two hours. We'd meet on Zoom and um, we would check in with each other at the beginning of the call and then darken our screens and mute our microphones and write for two hours. And then we would circle back at the end of the call and everyone would kind of report on, hey, how this is how it went and this is what we did. Um, and at first I was like, seriously, we're going to be accountable to people on Zoom. Like, you got to be joking. Right, 
Right. But there was something about knowing that there were anywhere from like 10 to 14 other people out there doing the same thing as you at the same time. And I'd find like sometimes if I got frustrated or if I got distracted, I'd just like go back and look at the darkened screens on Zoom. Like, oh, they're still there, you know, or see. Right. right. Um, so that really helped propel me forward. And kind of by like the fall of 2020, 20, 2021, I was really starting to refine and kind of build out my thought process and habits framework, if you will, a little bit right. more. Um, but it really took having other people around me to to give me the nudge that I needed. Right. And so was yeah. it just that group that led to the the book itself or did you actually work with like in a formalized writing program where you go from, you know, nothing to completed published book at some point? Oh, so, the publisher that I worked with, they were the ones that ran this writing group. Okay. They're publishing process is like a separate thing from the writing group. Okay. Um, so I was able to get kind of feedback within that writing group on various sections of the book, but it wasn't really until I handed in my super messy first vomit draft, as they say, <laughs> right. um, that I got some really hardcore editorial feedback okay. on the writing. Um, okay. I know there's some other writing, gr writing groups out there that you do a piece and you get immediate feedback and you have a structure mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. I found the process that I did was a little bit more, um, I don't know what the right word is, fluid. Okay. Um, and that happened to work for me at the time. Um, I don't know that my next book would necessarily be that way um, because I think now I have, I've sort of unlocked what's possible with writing books and how it can go. Um, right. So just, but I think for that first one, I literally needed to get all the stuff out, like empty the junk drawer, as they say, mm -hmm. to be able to know what I wanted to put back in and what wanted to land in the book. Oh, no, that makes complete sense. Well, let's so let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about the book. I mean, I mentioned the title "Walking Forward," but um, that yeah, if you have if you have a have you have one here, and I have my digital copy that I read. Yeah. That's awesome. There it is. There Using is. the power of habit to navigate the chaos of life one step <laughs> at a time. Yeah, I love that picture too. Is that from Scotland? It is from Scotland. It was taken um, hiking the West Highland Way last summer. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, someone that's not familiar with your book, what would you? What's kind of? What, how would you give it a quick synopsis? What would you? For say sure. It's about? Yeah. So it's a book um, about how I've used the power of habit, both consciously and unconsciously, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. to navigate um, chaos and uh, uncertain times. And it has really been shares how I've learned to use habits strategically to move myself towards things I want to do or how I want to be in the world. Right. Right. Um, I wrote it in such a way that it's not just stories about me, but there's lessons learned that people can take away from each section. Um, and I added these little questions at the end of each section or takeaways, I guess. I called them footprints building on the building on the walking theme. The walking. I love that. <laughs> um, but uh, there are, you know, little questions to consider at the end of each section. Mm -hmm. And what's been cool about it since the book came out at the end of March is I've had people saying to me, you know what, Sarah, I sit with my journal and I read a section and then I'll like answer the questions and reflect on them as I go. Right. Um, so that's been pretty cool that way. Which, but, yeah. It seems like that was probably exactly how you hope people would digest it. It was, yeah. And yeah. I was like, this is really neat that people are, it's kind of working how I had envisioned. Um, yeah. Well, well, one thing, it, just in reading it, one thing that I really enjoyed is is you do have a lot of kind of personal, open, honest stories in there that give, give folks a really good, I mean, we learn through story and I think you give folks a really good, uh, basis for that learning in your own personal journey and then they can take that and as you mentioned you have the foot, the footprints which are things that you kind of take away and learn from so I mean I I loved the way that you brought a lot of personal story into the book and kind of walked th people through that process thank you yeah it was I think it was a f interesting because you know the book was written I don't know I guess over the course of like a year and a 
year sort of or so. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the stories that ended up in there, you know, as I was going through the editing process, I was like, do I really want this in here? <laughs> there was right. some, there was some elements of that, but I think, um, you know, certainly some of the work that had been done um, through Philip McKernan in Ireland really empowered me to keep that stuff in. Um, right. Well, that was, there was that as well. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a, that's a big topic or a big um, question. I think a lot of writers or creatives have, uh, or, or anytime you share content online or in the world is, is how personal, how open, how honest to be with what you do put out there. So I think what advice would you have for someone that's kind of thinking, oh, is this story a little too personal? Do I feel comfortable putting this out there? How's this going to be, be received? Kind of what's your approach to that now since you have your book out in the world and are starting to get some feedback on that? Yeah, I think there's the advice is sort of twofold. And one is to start um, because the more you think about it, the more you're going to spin your wheels and the bigger the story you're going to tell yourself about why you can't do it. Um, so, but when you're starting, it doesn't actually have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be some massive, massive story. Um, and I think it, you know, you can start with one small piece mm -hmm. to start putting your voice out there. And, you know, in my own personal experience, that's actually what really held me back for the longest time. Um, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I really felt like, oh, they have such a better story to tell. Or this other person, they've been through this, 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 and this. Who am I to think that what I have to say matters? Right. Um, and it really, like, it, it was a real limiting belief that I held on to my, uh, about myself for a really, really, really long time. Um, and it, I really started to disconnect from that belief when I did my six week writing challenge at the start of the start of 2020. Um, and then I was able to look back at what I'd written and say, well, I'm just going to nudge some of that out there and put it up on a personal blog that I'm not going to tell anybody about. So technically it's in public, but nobody knows. Right. 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 Absolutely. Um, and but what I found is because I'd been building the the muscle, so to speak, the writing mm -hmm. muscle, and had sort of started to find my voice and figure out how I wanted to talk and what I wanted to share or what I was, you know, okay doing. Right. Um, by the time I actually told people what I was doing, it was, yes, it was scary. And yes, I was so terrified that there'd be so much judgment of like, what does she, what is she even doing? Mm -hmm. um, but I came to realize is that even if there was just one person who read something in what I put out there and it, they felt either, you know, helped or um, seen or not so alone, um, then that was, then I had made a difference with my work. No, that's wonderful. And yeah. now, I mean, we, we were talking about it in the context of, of writing, but obviously mm -hmm. there's there's other ways to do that, whether you're a musician, if you're starting to record some YouTube videos, whatever it may be. I mean, there's numerous platforms where you can post something to, yeah. so it's quote unquote public. And yet if it's not publicized, no one's going to kind of stumble across it or find it unless it's there. So, I mean, I think yeah. that's a really good piece of advice. It's just putting it out there somewhere and it's not like you have to immediately go out and tell the world and splash it on your social. It can just kind of reside out there and, mm -hmm. and you know, it's there and it's a start. So that's, yeah. Yeah. That's so it's the, it's just the starting, getting started and starting to get comfortable with expressing yourself creatively. However, that might be, if it's sharing your pictures, if it's sharing, you know, a video, if it's playing your guitar on YouTube. Right. Um, the world needs more people to share. So you're, going. I mean, you're essentially, let's, what you say, you started putting your blog out and what you said, roughly 2020. Is that when you first yeah, started I put, putting my very out first, there? Yeah, my very first essay, Things I Learned in Six Weeks of Writing, such an original title, uh, mm -hmm. was published at the start of March of 2020. Okay, so basically three years, a little over three years right now. Where, yeah. where in that amount of time, where do you think your comfort level is now? Like how much... Ha how big a shift have you felt in how comfortable you feel kind of being in the public sphere now? I'm pretty comfortable with it. Like it's, 
um, it's taken a, it's taken a while. I had like this absolute terrified moment, probably about a month or six weeks before walking forward was published of mm, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe this is just too, um, too much. And I don't want to, I don't want this out in the world. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pull the plug. Right. <laughs> um, but it's, I found that, so it, there were like various sort of points. There was the quietly starting publishing my essays. Then there was telling them, telling people about them. Um, and I kind of, for a period in that middle period there kind of went dark a little bit because I wasn't totally sure. I felt like I should be saying something, um, but it's not, but it just didn't feel it just didn't feel aligned. Like I started, there was a moment there for a while when I started writing for what I thought other people wanted to hear mm -hmm. um, versus what I had to say. Absolutely. Um, and what was meaningful to me. And it, it was at that point, like that, that was a real sort of like, mm, no, this isn't working anymore. Uh -huh. And I'd say about like last September of 2022, when I started um, consistently sending out my Friday letter that I send to my subscribers and I was really working hard on, you know, getting the book firmed up. Um, right. That's where it just became like, oh, I'm just going to say what I want because this is what's on my heart this week. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, let's speak to that just a moment. Uh, you kind of mentioned um, if you have anything to some phrases, you know, if you have anything to say, like, how do you know if you have anything to say? How do you know if people are going to really either resonate with that, pay attention, care, like what advice would you give to someone that's like, I've been journaling for a while or I've been singing some songs, I've been doing whatever. And they have that fear of what well, do I really have anything to say or kind of what's the point of putting it out there? Like, how would you encourage them or what would you say to them to make them realize that they do have something mm -hmm. to say or that maybe they're, that they don't have anything to say, you know, let's look at both sides of the coin. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for me, the bottom line is everybody has something to contribute mm -hmm. in some way. And I think a lot of people spend time hiding behind um, their discomfort at expressing themselves creatively, even pe people who say, Oh, I'm not a creative person. I'm like, actually, right. you are. like, everybody is in some way, shape or form. Right. And for me, it's it, or the way I see it is that it's a, a practice of creation and mm -hmm. of creating and the more you do it and the more you are accountable in some way shape or form so if it is to your social media feed if it is just to yourself saying i'm going to post x number of words per week or one song a week to youtube or whatever mm -hmm. there's some level of accountability that it's not just hiding in a drawer in your desk right um and the more you do that, the more you build momentum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the old, and I'm probably going to like completely muck up and you can correct me on this one, the, like the physics side of thing, right? But like energy, energy really breeds energy. So the more you, the more energy you put into something, the more momentum and energy you're going to get from it. Right. Um, and I find that's very true with any kind of, creative craft that you're working on. Right. Um, along those lines, talk a little bit about, obviously some days in writing, occasionally you just, you know, feel like home runs, feel like I'm, what's coming out of me feels fantastic. And, and those days are easy, but talk a little bit about in the creative process when maybe some of the other days, like the days that just, that just feel like kind of junk or you're like, what did I, am I in my kindergarten here? Like how long have I been trying to write? Like, What's your thought process around those and how they fit into your whole creative process? Yeah, so it's a little bit, I kind of like to have a little bit of structure to my creative process, mm -hmm. but at the same time allow for, like kind of like what I was describing with my journal. I like the blank page. I like to be able to write sideways up and down and all over the place. But I also like to have an idea of what I'm intending to do at that particular session. Okay. And um, so to like, to sort of explain that a little bit further, what it looks like specifically for me is to have a list of 
topics that I want to explore. I can't believe you uh, have a list, Sarah. <laughs> I, know, I like my list. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, um, and it's a topic, like, and it's a running list. It's not always in a particularly organized fashion. Um, mm -hmm. Like nine times out of ten, it's a series of sticky notes that I've jammed in five thousand different places. Right. Um, but on the mornings, so there's sort of two parts of that. On the mornings when I really, really don't want to do anything, uh -huh. um, I have at least a starting point. And that helps to a point. Um, but then there's like the days when just absolutely nothing happens. And it's like right. junk. And I sit and stare at the world. And I find every reason under the sun not to do what I want right. to do. Um, and it's kind of on those days where I'm just like, well, that that didn't work out like I thought. Right. And tomorrow's a new day. So I'm going to start fresh tomorrow. And are your right is your creative or writing process? Do you do kind of like a morning pages style separate from okay now I'm doing book writing or is writing kind of all one, all one thing? What does that look like? Um, but with the book writing process was interesting because I found I got so head first into it, I kind of set other things aside. Like mm -hmm. it was all I could, all I could think about. Right. Um, it's actually been a bit liberating having the book published now because I can do more of a morning pages type approach to things. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's just topics and it's, you know, it's kind of what I was speaking to earlier that once you start, you know, you start to get more ideas as you go. And right. so there's a ton of like ideas that I have about topics I want to explore and things I want to write more on. Um, so it's kind of, that's been really, I mean, for the past couple of months anyway, has been really good, but it took me a while to start really getting back into that space again. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. I think is a, how do you capture those ideas? What, what, what's interesting to me is sometimes I'll be, you know, writing or doing something and an idea for something I want to write on or mm -hmm. something pops up. Do you, do you keep a list of those somewhere separately and just kind of a running list and so that you can capture it and then go back to what you're writing or, or if something strikes you, do you just dive into it? No, I'll, I'll set it aside. Um, okay. Like, you know, I used to, I guess it was one thing that I learned back in my corporate days, we used to call it a parking lot in meetings. Okay. You know, we'll, just, we'll just park that idea. And so I, I still, I kind of use, use that like, you know, approach with my like, millions of like sticky notes that I have lying mm -hmm. around and I'll just, I usually have one at easy to reach and I'll scribble whatever the idea is on it and then figure out if it's something I want to actually come back to before it derails me too much. Yeah. I think that's the, that's definitely one of the first, like rule number one is capture the idea, right? Because I, yeah. I, it's so funny. I, I wonder how many amazing books or amazing ideas or whatnot have been lost over time because you just didn't have the pen and paper or you didn't have the voice memo or you didn't have the the way to capture it. So Yeah. Yeah. Like if I'm out if I'm out walking, um it I'll use like voice memos on my okay. phone to really remind myself of something and um or just even I've just even I've actually talked whole essays on walks into my phone before. Really? Um it just feels how, sometimes how much it, yeah. I'm always curious about that. How much editing? So you do something like that. Let's say you capture a voice memo. And I know actually people, they say one way to write a book or to write anything is actually if you're, if you don't enjoy sitting down in front of the blank page is to kind of dictate it into a, you know, into your phone and then mm -hmm. transcribe it and, and do it that way. I'm, I'm always curious, like when you have done that, how kind of much editing in the, on the back end how, does that take you or you capture it pretty, pretty solidly? No, it needs a lot of editing on the back okay. end. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, I mean, I'll even I was using a um, Otter, the voice note app mm -hmm. Otter, because you could transcribe things. Right. But then I got frustrated because I didn't like how it transcribed what I was trying to say. Sure. So now I just use the good old voice memos on the iPhone to do it. Right. So it, it actually and then I'll um, listen to it and key it in as I'm as I'm thinking. And so that actually helps to really sort of clarify what I was trying to. Got it what I was trying to say. I love that. No, mm -hmm. those are great tips. Um, all right. I got a couple of things here. So I want to, so, so we kind of talked about the transition you made. You met your husband, mm -hmm. soon, future husband, 
now husband, in college, and that was kind of a shift for you because of the people that you were kind of hanging around. So graduated college, I know um, kind of when I met you, your primary business at that point was interior design. Yeah. Um, so coming out of college, was that your was that your full progression, or or kind of where did things go post college? I kind of I kind of jumped around a lot. Okay. Um, at as I was finishing up my degree, I was starting to get super anxious about what I was going to do, and I didn't have a job, and mm-hmm. on and on and on and on. Um, so I had gotten a phone call from a company that I'd worked with between my third my my or just before my last year of university and they said you know what we've got somebody going on maternity leave and we need somebody to cover the position are you available i was like yes i am nice (laughs) so i kind of took it because it was a job not because it was anything i particularly wanted to do Mm -hmm. um and really and that was sort of the story of my professional career for a long time i would kind of be like okay so this is good maybe i want to try something else okay, so that didn't work out. So let's try something else. And it, um, I kind of, I just sort of jumped around a lot. And I was really good at finding excuses why something didn't, didn't work. Right. Um, And I didn't, for like the longest time, I thought that somehow I had failed at my career. um, Because it didn't follow the example that I knew growing up, which was you graduate school and you get a job and that's your life. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I'm certainly now of the mindset of, you know, everyone has multiple careers in them and it doesn't matter at what age you're at. There's always possibility to, um, to try something new and to, right. to shift and pivot. So. How does that, you have, let's see, two sons, in college and one about to go is that no i've got all three i've got um three boys so one okay. just is just finishing his um grade nine or freshman year of high school okay and one just finished his first year of university right. and his twin brother took a gap year between high school and university right so how does your experience uh, this is fascinating especially i mean it's a very different age from just when you and i were in mm-hmm. in university to you know what it is now how does your experience kind of inform what you're maybe guiding or or letting your own boys do or kind of the window that you're giving them and what advice would you have for you know other parents other folks that that are at that similar similar kind of precipice at the moment yeah it was um really interesting so i guess the biggest one is that i was i really encouraged my kids to take gap years um okay one did and one didn't and that was just their you know their decision Mm -hmm. um and i had a number of people say to me when my son decided to defer um school they said well aren't you worried he's not going to go back well aren't you worried that like this will happen and aren't you worried about this and aren't you worried about that and that thought probably i would say like even five years ago would have been top of mind Right. What if he doesn't? What if he's living in my house the whole for the rest of his life? What if he's doing this? Um, and it he was so he needed the break from school so badly um, that and he was so excited for what he was, you know, the potential for what the year ahead held for him. Um, I didn't really I stopped worrying about it because I was able to focus not on what my worries were or what or fears, I guess. And it really helped me just see the, see him for the kid that he is. Um, and it actually even got me comfortable with like, well, if he doesn't go to school, or if he doesn't do this, he'll figure it out because he's a pretty, he's a kid who can figure stuff out. Sure. And it just, it really helped me letting go of that fear of his journey might not be, might not look what my, like mine was. Right. Um, made a big difference. Yeah. No, that's great. And it was so, kind of having to let go of other people's opinions and expectations along the way as well. How, how much of that do you think as a parent is how you almost parent from zero until they're out of the house? Like, 
if you've, d- I even hate to use this expression, but if, if you've kind of done your job as a parent or if you've parented, then, you know, by the time they get to that age, they should, you should feel pretty comfortable that, you know, they're going to go out, they're going to do exploring. All of us have made decisions in hindsight. And we're like, oh, that probably wasn't a great choice, but we've learned from it in theory. So how much of it do you think is like laying that groundwork ahead of time and just and just letting them have their life versus, um, I don't know, I guess the flip side would be kind of tr- being, trying to be a little more controlling on the back end and make sure that they don't kind of follow the unconventional path. Yeah, I mean, I liken it a little bit to like a safety net. So when the kids were really little, like if if they were here, the safety net was super close. Oh, and as they've gotten older, it's a little bit more of dropping that safety net lower and lower. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, even now that they're 18 turning 19, they're, the safety net's still there. It's just lower than it used to be. Right. Um, and it's been a bit of an evolution where the role has now shifted where I'm merely there as an advisor to them and not i have very limited influence in terms of telling them what to do right Um, and i think it's sort of been like an interesting you know interesting shift like in a very recent example is um my one 18 year old who's like he's home for university for summer right now um he had you know he had some health stuff going on that he needed to get looked at and the walking clinic he went to said we don't have the right imaging here you're going to need to go to the hospital to get it looked at. And it was a weird moment for me because I didn't go with him. And at first I was like, oh, I should be sitting with him. Well, it turns out he was there for like seven hours. So I'm kind of glad I, you know, it was, and he didn't need me. He was literally just sitting there, but there were, you know, a few phone calls saying, mom, how do I handle this? Or what's your advice in the best? Like, how would I ask this question? And so it's sort of the coaching to, you know, advocate for yourself and be persistent. Don't wait for people to come tell you things. And so that was a really like, it was, it was such a eye opening moment for me to realize that I don't have to, um, I think like the health stuff was probably like one of the final things to let go of with them. Um, Mm -hmm. and that was really, I mean, that was an example from two weeks ago. So it's like, huh, okay, this is where we're at. (laughs) Yeah, that's it's that's quite a shift. It's it's a big, for, especially for a mother or for any parent, really. Yeah, and I was feeling really guilty that I wasn't there, and then, and he kept saying, "He's like, Mom, what are you going to do? Like, you're just going to sit here, and we'll probably right. annoy you." Like, no, yeah. That's probably- <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I know I keep bouncing back and forth a bit, but yeah. jobs, you kind of bounced around a bit, and then. Yeah. Um, what is that that brings us through um Um, why about like my sort of mid to late 20s i would say okay i had settled into a role um working in the operations area for a large a large bank and it was a really cool company to work for um everyone there was super smart and super driven. It was, you know, a challenging environment to work in because everybody was so super smart. So you had to be on your toes all the time. And Mm -hmm. there was a lot of pressure to perform and get results. Um, But I really liked it. And um, so that was, I was, that was probably like my longest stop in the corporate world, I would say at 11, no, 10 years, I guess, by the time I was. That's a good chunk. That's a long time. Yeah. And then, and then when did you transition into interior design in your own kind of entrepreneurial business. So I had, when I went back to work after having my twins, it was really, it was hard to juggle working in such a high pressure environment. Um, And, you know, in hindsight, we didn't do a good enough job or I didn't do a good enough job of seeking out help and putting supports in place to make it work. Like supports in place, like, um, like the kids, you know, they were in daycare, but it would have been better if we had more help at home. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, if they were sick, who did that fall to? Like there was just a lot of like side or traveling for work was like a gong show trying to figure all that out. Like there was just a lot of things that I, in hindsight, I didn't ask for help 
when I really needed it, I just kind of put my head down and slogged through it. Uh -huh. um, so by the time I was pregnant with my third, all I could think about is I can't, there's no way I can go back to that environment with right. three little kids like that is just crazy town. Um, and so I didn't go, I took my mat leave and I didn't go back. Nice. <laughs> um, but we did a big renovation on our house. And at the time I started working, I was doing design work for um, a local, a general contractor. Um, he had people asking him all the time for design help. And he didn't necessarily want to help people choose paint colors and do all that stuff. And so I started working um, with him and then decided to go back to school um, and uh, go back to school for that. And sort of my business kind of just grew, grew from there from personal referrals. And, and, and how long, how long were you in that? Like, how long did you have your business, that business? It's, it's still going. Um, still going. But it, Got yeah, it. but it's mostly just working with clients that I've worked with before. Sure. Um, okay. So they're coming back. So it's probably, I guess it was like two, th yeah, about 12 years or so. Nice. And, mm -hmm. and then, so what was really the, what was really the impetus for you to kind of, you've been writing, been journaling for a number of years, but like what really pushed you over the edge to take the leap and just say, okay, I'm officially doing this book. Was it an event? Was it... You know, we've been, and I want to talk just a little bit about kind of the power of of retreat time and reflection mm -hmm. time. But I, I wondered, is there is there one thing that really kicked you over the edge on that? Yeah, I, I mean, part of it was the whole um, COVID pandemic lockdown scenario. Okay. The year, the year leading up to it, I, I had been at one of the retreats um, with mm -hmm. you. That's where you and I first met. And so that had kind of started to like open my eyes to possibility i think is the right word and right. really starting to understand myself better and understanding the idea of what was possible better mm -hmm. um but then when i realized it things just started to get really tricky work-wise you know with lockdowns and who can do this and who can't do that and right. i found myself annoyed with everybody i was annoyed with contractors i was annoyed with my clients i was annoyed with suppliers mm -hmm. and i was the common denominator in it all um and it kind of forced me to take a really hard look at what i was doing and realizing that it like i loved it at one point but it really told me that it was perhaps time to to move on right and i really at that point knew i wanted to build on the writing work and figure out what that could look like in terms of um, you know, working with other people to help them in the way that I had uncovered these things for myself. Right. Um, so that's kind of sort of the journey that it's on. And I'm the, I guess with walking forward is that it's the idea that it's sort of launching me into the next, the next evolution, I guess right. you could say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your book, it, it, it has a tremendous amount of personal reflection, but, but there is a lot of tactical, information in there i mean it's it's very practical um i mean it's it's really built I, I, one phrase i've written down that i want to chat with you about is this idea how that habits lead to calm in chaos mm -hmm. and yeah and I, I think that's a theme that that continues to surface in your book so um how, where have you how do you kind of implement that in your own life uh, as an example of habits leading to leading to K or leading to the calming of chaos. Yeah. So it's the idea of, I mean, for me personally, I would say one of the biggest grounding habits for me is what I do in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Um, because I find if I have that stable start to my day, I can kind of manage what's what happens throughout the day. Right. But I guess the bigger part of it is knowing having developed the clarity and the knowing what works and what doesn't work for me. It's almost like it's informed my decision tree, if you will. Um, when right. opportunities come along, I, because I've worked to develop the clarity of what I want to do or what's important to me or the type of person that I want to be, it really makes, it helps make decisions when something comes up. Because I can say, yeah, this is aligned with what I'm thinking. And no, this isn't. Um, right. 
and I don't always get it right. <laughs> um, but what I'm finding is I'm getting it right more often than I'm getting it wrong. Um, right. And that's been really, really transformational because what was happening before is when I was saying yes to things that weren't aligned with, you know, they would enable me to, they would mean that, for example, I would stay up late and be exhausted. Or, um, you know, I was with people whose energy didn't, I don't know, didn't line up with the type of person I wanted to hang around or that type of thing. Um, it would just leave me feeling, you know, it would just sort of, I guess it would just be like, you know, walking backwards, I guess you could say. Right. Um, so it's, having the clarity to say, Hey, this works for me. And this doesn't work for me helps me manage the sort of the, the chaos piece of it, which is, um, requests or unexpected things or, you know, decisions and that sort of thing to be able to be able to sort of decide what, what makes sense. Right. That's really interesting because literally just over the last few days, I've been, I've been playing around this, this, idea of clarity creates confidence. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that when you're very clear about either who you are, or as you're mentioning, maybe, you know, what role you want to play, what you want to do, you're very confident, or you become much more confident in the decisions that you make. I mean, when you have clarity on, on, on who you are, or the type of work that you want to do, it's just like you can turn away those requests that aren't a good fit, because yeah. you're confident in knowing they're not good. When so many times, and I, I find this, this is a huge reflection, a huge issue that I really deal with sometimes is, is like when you're just kind of going along and you, you don't have that clarity, then it's like everything seems like a potential opportunity that you don't want to miss out on. And, and by trying to do everything, you kind of do nothing well, or you don't have time and space when the right opportunity comes along. So it's really fascinating yeah. that you mentioned this idea of clarity. So talk to me a little bit about, yeah. you mentioned your morning routine really sets you up for the, for the day. And what is yep. your morning, what does your morning routine look like? So my morning routine is I'm generally a early riser. Um, I always have been. And I think a lot of that's just the reflection of having gotten up and gone to the pool for five in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so much right. of my teenage years. Um, but I like to get up early before anyone else in the house um, because I like the quiet in the morning the best. So literally I will get up, I will uh, drink some lemon water, I will brew myself a cup of tea and um, I will do a meditation and I'll stretch and I'll write in my journal and I'll usually do sort of some, I'll write some notes of gratitude in my journal and then I'll usually do some morning page type writing activity for about 20 or 30 minutes or so. Okay, so somebody listening says, wow, that, that sounds like a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of different pieces. Like roughly how long would you say, what amount of time in the morning do you dedicate to that whole process? Anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not a tremendous amount of time when you think about it because you're gonna get up and have some water and drink some tea and do all those things yeah. anyway. So I think, I think the key thing that I've learned is what I don't do in the morning. Okay. Um, and what I don't do in the morning is, and I'm, you know, not perfect. I want to just preface it with that, but I don't scroll my phone in the morning. Um, yeah. and like, I try, you know, I try desperately not to like get distracted by like emptying the dishwasher. That can, mm -hmm. that'll happen when it happens. And usually it's my husband who gets frustrated. No, he doesn't get frustrated. He just comes down and does that while his coffee's brewing. Um, but the, you know, like I it very intentionally don't want to do like task type of things. Right. Um, to start, to start the day. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. One of your, I think one of your chapter headings in your book or one of the questions that comes up is, this notion of getting clarity on who do you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit, because I think, again, that brings back that theme of clarity and that clarity giving you confidence. And so understanding who you want to be in, and, and in my mind, that's not, it's not something as like, once you figure it out, that's who you necessarily have to be forever. It's kind of, tell me if you have a different thought on this, but it's like, who do you want to be in this present moment? Who do you want to be 
until for as long as you want to be that person until you have a realization or something changes and you want to switch. So kind of how do you think about that question? Who do you want to be in? And how do you find some clarity around that? I think it is asking yourself a lot of questions. Um, and I think there needs to be an element of taking time to pause to do it. Mm -hmm. um, because you're not going to be able to fully, you're not going to be able to understand even pieces of it when you've got, when you're trying to do other things. Right. Um, and it could be just understanding, you know, reflections on what your life looked like when you were growing up and understanding a little bit about the journey that shaped you to get you to the point where you are today. Right. Um, but I think there's also like an interesting element of looking forward and saying, you know, this is the type of person that I see myself being. Um, and getting the clarity of, you know, what does that, like, what does that look like? And I'll, I'll sort of give you an example to help sure, please. A, little, a little bit. But one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is what do I want, what type of person do I want to be when I'm 90, for example? Um, and the whole, um, you know, the idea, and I, I think you listen to like Huberman and Peter Atia, those podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, but Peter Atia in particular talks a lot about the concept of health span versus lifespan. Right. And <clears throat> when I first heard him say that, I hadn't, I was, I was kind of thinking, oh, well, that was really interesting. But it made a ton of sense to me because I love the idea of thinking about what type of person I want to be when I'm 90. So like, I want to be able to get up and off the ground with ease. Um, I want to be able to hike in the mountains. No problem. Um, there's all sorts of things I want to do. So if I back that up to where I am today, if that's the person I see myself being in my nineties, what type of person does that look like now in my late forties? And what right. are the types of behaviors that do that? And so having that sort of vision or clarity around like forward looking, and it doesn't have to be as far out as 90. This just happens to be this particular example that's been on my brain a lot uh -huh. is what types of things do I need to do? So I need to do, um, you know, I need to move my body every day and it just can't be just can't be like moving my body, but like I, you know, things like do Pilates, for example, because mobility is a big thing. And so it challenges right. you in different ways. And so it's kind of like getting that clarity around looking forward into the future a little bit um, and then backing it up again. And what it does is it gives yourself the um, insight to say, and what I and what I'm doing now are the decisions I'm making now are the things I'm saying now aligned with who I want to be in the future. Right. And what's interesting about that is that I think a lot of people don't actually stop to even say, who do I want to be in the future? And I sure didn't for the longest time. Um, yeah. So it's really, you know, I think you spend a lot of time saying, oh, well, I used to be this way, or I feel like I'm getting so old, or I f there's times running out and I don't have enough time left to do this. And it's kind of like, I go a little bit mental when I hear people say, oh, I'm too old to do that. And I'm like, no, you're not. No. Um, <laughs> so yes. it's, uh, um, you know, so that's kind of like an example in terms of who you are being today is kind of a reflection of who you're going to be tomorrow, unless you're very intentional about what you're doing today. Yeah, no, exactly that. And, and so this kind of leads into, um, a question on how to do that on, on kind of different time frames. So you and I met on a, on a retreat, a personal development retreat, retreat that was held in Ireland. And that was r roughly a six day retreat. So seven day retreat in total. Um, Talk to me a little bit about how you think of kind of the short duration. So what you may do on, on a daily basis in terms of, you know, adding it into your morning routine versus and how that how that plays into looking forward versus and the need for maybe these longer extended retreats. And, and what does the interval look like? Is it do you think about oh, I want to do a long retreat a year? Do I want to do a couple of days a quarter like? How do you think about that when you're trying to look forward and fitting in that into your 
into your life? Yeah, it's um, so until I did that first longer one, which was um, almost four years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really appreciate just how powerful it was to have that longer space to think and to pause and to regroup. Um, right. But then once I had it, I knew how important it was to me. Um, and, you know, I'm truth be told, I'm not as good about taking, figuring out how to plan and, and get that time to work. Um, I mean, I'm in sort of a space right now where I'm really craving it. Um, mm -hmm. And because I know how it would calm my nervous system and just like settle my brain, my brain right. down. Um, so it's really now that I have the awareness to be able to do it or uh, the awareness of the effects of doing it, I would say like, you know, yes, like a longer week is for me would be ideal like once a year, but I actually almost think it would probably be better to do twice a year and maybe mm -hmm. not a week, but something something right. along those lines. What, what do you kind of feel like maybe is the minimum? I know this is kind of a loaded question, but let's say someone's trying to think, you know, I can't do a week, but maybe I could do, you know, two days at a hotel an hour away. Like where is that line between having enough time to drop in and, and kind of feel that pace and get that clarity or peace and get that clarity versus, um, you know, you're just, you're just trying to cram a, a square peg into a round hole and you're not going to ultimately get what you're looking for out of that. Where do you, where do you see that line being? Yeah. I mean, I think you need like a, at least a full day. So if okay. you were to, in your example, um, you know, a hotel an hour away, for example, but you have like two nights. So, right. and then you have a full day in the middle. Right. Um, that certainly would give you time to not feel like you have to get up and go the next day, not feel like you have to stay up all night to do what you want to do. You can get some good sleep. You mm -hmm. can move your body. You can do whatever. Um, that, you know, I think is a really, a really good way to start. Right. Uh, I think there's other things too, like, um, you know, even going for a walk or for a long car ride, without mm -hmm. a podcast and without talking to anybody and without the radio and just sitting like just you and your your brain type idea right um and i think the default now is for people to listen to podcasts or books or whatever right um instead of just letting their thoughts ramble and wander i can't remember who it is but i've heard recently about someone has this notion of essentially going for the 12 hour walk with no you know, no yeah. headphones, just what you were saying, just, just silence. Yeah, so there, um, it's uh, Colin O'Brady. That's um, right. Yes. Yeah. So he wrote a book called the 12 hour walk. I read okay. it last fall. Actually. So that's, that's one of the things that's been on my, my right. hit list um, to do this summer is just literally try that out and see what that's that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, one other, th I mean, I could talk to you for about another three hours just about things in your book, but one thing I did want to touch on, um, in one of those retreats in Ireland, and you mentioned this in your book, we did this did an, an obituary exercise in which we sat down. Actually, we're sitting in a graveyard mm -hmm. um, at a small church in Ireland, in the in the countryside of Ireland, and it was kind of to imagine what you would like your obituary to be. I'm assuming you lived, you know, a full, happy, healthy life. In essence, what what do you hope that people would say about you? Think about you. What were you hope your obituary eulogy would be so can you talk a little bit about kind of that exercise and and what you got out of it and maybe what you think other folks could and feel free to expand on the exercise itself so if someone would like to try to do it themselves kind of what that might be like yeah for sure i mean i remember that particular day we were wandering around looking at the um the tombstones and they had the names and how long they lived and one of the thoughts at that point that was going through my head was, I wonder what my family would say when they're gathered around my gravesite. And the sort of the next piece of it was, is um, thinking about the opportunity to remember yourself in the way you want to be remembered. Mm -hmm. And 
which I think is a real shift from a sort of traditional obituary, which is where people write something of what they think people would want to say about you. And that particular exercise I found so powerful because it was the opportunity for me to say, this is how I want to be remembered. Um, This is the things I want people to say about me. And then it offered me the opportunity to sense check that and say, am I doing the things that I say I want to be remembered for um, in my obituary? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the super powerful piece of it for me. So I, when I started writing that exercise um, and, you know, I do share the obituary that I wrote in in forward, but it's the piece of it. I kind of wrote it a little bit forward looking, knowing that I wasn't quite doing everything at that point, but what it helped me really do was focus on these are the things that are important to me. So I want to make sure that I'm continuing to do those things or I want to start those things or, let go of other things. Um, and it just, it kind of helped to like narrow, narrow my focus a little bit right? and stop thinking about this is what I want people to say. And instead actually just saying, this is what I want you to say. Right. So it's, yeah, it's like kind of taking, taking control of your own life. Well, and it's interesting too. I mean, one thing um, that I think came up for you and then i kind of also remembers that initially you have this feeling around um, kind of accomplishments or, you know, titles like Sarah was a good mother, Sarah was a good, which you want all of those things. But it, I mean, talk a little bit about how you want people to like remember you other than just title wise, like the, the feelings and, and the, the expressions that you want to have around versus maybe something that you achieved. Yeah. So I want, like, I think the biggest thing is I want people to remember how I made them feel when I was with them. That's beautiful. Um, I don't want people to ever feel like they are, um, not worthy in some way, you Mm -hmm. know, when they start comparing themselves and it sort of goes across the board with just people that I might casually meet, um, to, you know, relationships with my kids, for example. And, um, you know, knowing that they are, you know, a huge relationship to me, but there's also a really important relationship to myself as well. Right. Um, Right. But that's kind of like, I want people to remember not necessarily what I did, but how I made them feel when we were together. So talk to me just a little bit about, so how does that translate into, you know, a direct life? Like, what do you think about when you're looking forward to, to make that shift so so that you're when you're around people they you're creating that feeling or at least you're hoping to create that feeling that you want them to have kind of going away from that interaction yeah for sure so it's things like um re- like when i'm having a conversation with somebody like really like ha- like i'm leaning into your screen now as i'm talking right, to you but exactly really having like a, co- a a conversation and not eyes darting all over the place, like wondering, oh, who's coming into the room or who can I talk to mm-hmm. next type idea. So that interaction is the only interaction for me in that moment. And right. then, um, you know, leaving that I would go on to talk to somebody else and it would be sort of the same, the same kind of, same kind of feeling. Right. Um, like it translates to my kids that I've become, I like, I used to be like miss multitasker of laptop open and on the phone and talking to my kids and doing whatever. And now it's just a, you know, like a leaning on the kitchen counter while they're talking about what happened at school that day or something like that. And it's, there's a real element of having to slow down, um, and not race through interactions with people is what right. I've noticed. And what's been really cool about it is since writing that obituary and since becoming super conscious of the feeling part mm-hmm. of it, um, it's in, not in every case, but in some cases it's extended to the way other people make me feel when I'm talking to them, right. um, which is really cool. Yeah, I was curious. Have you have you noticed a kind of a palpable shift in in now your interactions with others on how that's reflected back to you? 
A little bit, yeah. Yeah, and certainly the type of energy that I get from people. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's an evolving thing, I would say. I've, I've noticed it certainly the more shift at my end, but I'm starting to feel it with other interactions as well. And is that something that you kind of declared, like you basically told to your family, hey, you know, I know that I've kind of been distracted around you. Like I'm, my goal is to be more present with you and to be focused in you. I mean, did you explicitly state that or was it just kind of a, well, you kind of shook your head, you were shaking your head no there, but. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it just kind of happened. Um, okay. It's just, it was sort of a, I think it was like a semi-conscious decision at first. Um, right. And it became very conscious once I was aware of that type of behavior, that I was doing that right, or behaving in that way, in that distracted yeah. way. Would you recommend, I mean, what do you think about someone just saying to their family or friends or whoever they want to be more present with, just say, hey, declaring that right up front and saying, this is my goal. Please help me keep, please help keep me on task if I am, if I am showing up in this distracted manner. Do you think that would be a good approach or? Yeah, I totally do. And I think that, you know, you can, something that you can say to people is, hey, this is how I want to start showing up. Mm -hmm. But what I really need you guys to do is understand this is what I think it looks like. And as we go through, you know, are you, am, is what I'm saying is my behavior um, reflecting what I'm saying? I, I love that. Yeah. yeah that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be conscious of time here and not keep you too much more. Do we have like four or five more minutes? Are you good or you need? I've got all the time in the world for you. Oh, okay. Good. Um, well, in that case, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the two, so two things, two other things, and these kind of tie together, um, checking in on your dreams regularly and listening to your intuition, two themes that kind of come up in your book or do come up in your book, Walking Forward. How, how do you feel those two, do those two, two things tie together and um, what maybe habits or, or even little little things can people do to make sure that they're checking in on their dreams and listening to their intuition? Yeah. So one, I think for sure is to start to get clarity and giving yourself permission to dream, mm. um, which That's I think is something that you can kind of, it's, it's like anything, it's a habit. It's a mindset of right, right. giving yourself permission to say that where you are today doesn't always have to be where you are tomorrow. Okay. Um, and the whole sort of the idea of the blue sky type thinking that there's no, there's no limit on dreams is what I'm trying to say. And that's, um, well, the, even now, now just pausing on that statement, there's no limit on dreams. I think some people, maybe even most people are going to feel a little bit uncomfortable with that because they say, oh, well, I can't dream that big because I can, I can never do that. Like, yeah. what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the minute you start adding limiting beliefs to something, the minute your dreams start to shrink. And I think if you have that level of expansive thinking where that anything is possible, uh -huh. um, it gives yourself permission to walk, to, to sort of just move in that direction um, without without putting like a limit on things. So, right. you know, for example, that's too much money or I could never do that because I can never afford it. Right. Then you're always going to believe that you can't afford something. Um, mm. And it might not be that thing that's your dream, but because you've put a limiting belief like that in one space, it's going to trickle down to other parts, other parts of your life. Right. Um, so yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, I think there's like dreams like I want to be, I don't know, the Queen of England. It's a really crappy one. But the, um, you know what I mean? Like there's like right. some that are just so, but I'm talking about dreams like I want to hike or climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Like there's some things that that seems right now very impossible and can't figure out what it would look like or how it would go. But there's real power in writing down what your dreams are and looking at them in terms right. of what you've written them down. And, you know, you don't have to write them down every day. 
um, depending on how near or far those dreams are to where your current reality is at. But what's important is that you are thinking about that way and you're thinking about possibility and you're opening yourselves up because what will happen is when you sit with a, a mindset of possibility and expansive and open to anything right when various opportunities come at you all of a sudden you'll be ready to receive them as opposed to saying oh i'm not good enough or that's not enough mm -hmm. for me yeah. yeah it's almost like the universe sometimes will set in front of you uh what you think what what you think you deserve or what you're even even thinking about right so yeah, yeah. That, that's fascinating um yeah. One of the quotes in the book that I absolutely loved is this quote, maybe life like a yoga pose is best lived on edge. Mm -hmm. um, t tell me a little bit about what that kind of, what that means to you. Yeah, so it's, it comes, from, I mean, the quote, that story or section, I guess, came from my own sort of yoga experience where I felt like I was never bending into the correct position right um you know my downward dog my heels were never in the right position or i could never get into a pigeon pose properly or whatever and it was the idea that there is something somehow there's a right and a wrong way to do to do things mm -hmm. and then i realized that if you just push yourself a little bit further than you think you can often your body will stretch or your you will stretch in ways you didn't think were possible right and so like you, you know using the the yoga example once i let go of how it should be doing and just started to challenge myself each time i was doing something um it you know really sort of spoke to me the idea that there's not you need to just try to do something that you don't think you may not be capable of doing and it's the idea of that, you know, that edge of being bendy in a yoga pose versus executing or and executing the so-called perfect yoga pose versus attempting to get there, feeling kind of wobbly, but you've pushed yourself already further than you thought. And so it really sort of struck me the parallels between that and life of only taking yourself as far as you think you can do something versus pushing yourself just that little, bending yourself just that extra little bit um, further where you feel like you're kind of on the edge. Right. And you're never quite feeling very stable in that yoga pose, and nor are you really feeling that stable in life, but you're kind of pushing and challenging yourself just a little bit beyond your comfort zone, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, yeah. I think I've heard just recently heard this this notion that growth is between comfortable and impossible so that mm. space between what's comfortable and what you think is impossible like essentially just kind of what you're saying getting on the edge what would be an example of that i mean i know we were talking about yoga but um you know where else in life what would be another example of where someone may be able to push themselves just a little bit further than what's comfortable so that they can grow into something something else yeah so I think some of it might be like, for example, in like a work setting, mm -hmm. um, saying yes to something that makes you super nervous or super uncomfortable. So it could be a project at work that you may not feel like you're totally ready for or totally qualified for. Um, but somebody else in your organization thinks that you can do it and right. you've got the opportunity sitting in front of you. And you sort of have a choice at that point to say yes to it, even though you don't feel totally ready. Or you could say no and say, you know what, I'm not totally ready yet. I think it's better if so-and-so takes this on. But if you say yes to something when you're not totally ready for it, mm -hmm. there are ways to push yourself forward and take on that project at work. And by doing things like asking for help along the way, by doing mm -hmm. things like figuring out what are the small steps you can take to develop what that project plan looks like and who else do you need on your team and what does that all look like? So the right. idea that you can still say yes to something when you're not totally ready 
to do it or you don't think it will be uh, so-called perfect or whatever, uh-huh. but realizing that you can still say yes to it, but put some support in place, kind of like a spotter, right? Like mm-hmm. you, there's a spotter and the spotter might be your team or the people that you ask help for or, um, you know, mentors along the way. Um, right. So that would kind of be, you know, a, like a, a, a example, a non-yoga example um, to think about in that way. No, that's 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 perfect. And then along those same lines, I mean, when someone is pushing himself, I think the thing that everyone's afraid of is this notion of failure. So let's say I do mm-hmm. push myself and, you know, it doesn't work out and I, I quote unquote fail. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your viewpoint of failure. I mean, people view failure as negative, but in your experience or how would you how would you coach people to look at failure in that scenario when they're trying to grow? Yeah, so I used to not push myself to the point where I could fail. I would get myself so far and then bail out and say, that didn't work. When right. really, if I just pushed myself a little bit further, I might have succeeded and I might have failed. Mm-hmm. And what I've come to understand about the idea of failure now and what I coach people on and talk to people about is that Failure is merely a data point in life. It's a sort of a like a, an information point that says, okay, so that might not have worked out how I thought it was going to work out. Right. But this is what I learned about that particular experience. And sometimes there's like weird hidden, um, you know, silver linings or whatever you want to call it, where sure. unexpected things happen out of failure that you could never have anticipated. Mm-hmm. And... So it's the idea that you learn as much, if not more, from failure than you do from being successful at something. And you owe it to yourself to, to try it, even though you, it's not guaranteed. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm nodding my head along with you because I think I was similar in that I would essentially not attempt things that I thought there was even a possibility that I would fail at. I mean, that's yeah. actually one reason I started this podcast is I, I wanted to push myself into something that I, you know, who knows where this is going to go, but it's, it's, yeah. you know, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. Um, and the other adaptation I've made is, is it seems like we always think about failure in this, that, that, that there's this end point and it's either going to be at the end of this, it's either I'm going to be, I'm have succeeded or I have failed. But in actuality, everything we do is, is kind of part of our life. And so if you look at the whole journey, then I think it really locks in what you're saying of, hey, it may seem like a failure for this one little instance in what you're thinking about, but in the grand picture of your life, like that could be what opens the door to this, the next opportunity. And it's, it's really what you do with the outcome as opposed to the outcome necessarily itself is kind of what I hear you saying. Yeah, no, I really like how you just said that. It's, you know, it's, it's what you do with it, not what the actual it's, it's not being too caught up in what you thought the outcome would be. Right. Um, awesome. Uh, so are you working on another book yet? I've got an idea for a few different books. So I'm nice. still thinking about what that's going to look like. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, with this book. So obviously people definitely go out and get walking forward. Um, mm-hmm. It's fantastic. There's so much practical information, lots of exercises that you can do lots of takeaways from it and hopefully we've highly obviously highlighted some of this in this com- some of those in this conversation um i know this is again another loaded question but if if people could you know if a reader reads this and let's say they have three things if they could only have three things to take away from it what do you hope that that people would would finish your book and feel at the end of it or or take and use as they as they look forward and move forward into their life. Yeah, for sure. So I think the first one is whatever they're thinking about to just start it, to stop thinking and just start. Love that. And keep it, you know, keep it simple and don't overcomplicate it as you're going. The second piece is once you start, don't stop. So keep, you know, consistency, it builds the momentum and it goes on and on and on. And then I guess the third, the third piece that I really, really want people to take away from it is that um, 
life happens. Um, we are all, we're all human. And by definition, that means that we, things are going to come up that are beyond our so-called control. Mm -hmm. And that includes how we do things and to afford ourselves, um, a giant hug and a lot of kindness to ourselves. Right. And not beat ourselves up for things. So if things don't work out, if you don't continue doing something that you thought you wanted to be doing um, to regroup, to be kind to yourself, to understand that it's just one data point along the way of life and to circle back and keep going. So it's really wow. the three things. It's the idea That's of just start, keep going and be nice to yourself. That's beautiful. I, I love those. That is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, you mentioned you have a newsletter and you're doing your blog. Um, yeah. what is the, what's the best way for people to connect with you, follow you, stay yeah. on top of what you're doing? So for sure. So there's my website, which is sarahhepburn.ca. And yeah. on the homepage of the website, there is a little keep in touch button in the top right corner. I guess on mobile it might be in the top part but anyway it's a big button that says keep in touch and people can subscribe there to receive my weekly letter from sarah um i'm in the process of developing some more sort of habits tools and downloads that you can hear about in my weekly letter and they'll be on my website as well um i spend a fair amount of time on instagram and okay. i can be found there um at underscore Sarah Hepburn. And so it's Sarah with an H and then Hepburn, H-E-P-B-U-R-N, like Audrey or Catherine. <laughs> nice. Wonderful. And you post, uh, you post some great videos on Instagram. You usually do a, a it's a Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday tip. tip. Yeah. Tuesday so it's, tips. um, some of it is little Tuesday tips with Sarah is what I started a little while back. Um, people seem to really be really be liking them. Um, it's insights in terms of, you know, something that might have happened to me in a few days leading up to it. Some of it are stories from walking forward that I share. There's sort of a mix of things and those can all be found on my Instagram page as well. Well, just again, a huge, uh, just huge congratulations to you on an awesome, awesome book and just everything, the way you're showing up in the world and everything you're putting out there. Uh, it's greatly appreciated, and I just feel grateful to to have gotten a chance to know you uh, through a couple of retreats mm -hmm. and, and just have kept in touch. So thank you for all that you do and the way you're showing up in the world. This is awesome, Eric. Thank you so much. I loved our chat today. Yeah, me too. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. So. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Sarah. If you did, please be sure to like subscribe on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, wherever you found this. Definitely like and subscribe and rate us. If you listen to this on Spotify or Apple iTunes, please be sure to give us a, a review there as well. So thank you so much and have a great week.